All right. Well, I'm going to kind of, I got a stack of questions here. Thank you guys for filling those out. And I'm going to throw them out here for these guys. And um, I'll chime in if I think I, I can. But um, the first one here says, do you have any counsel for how to be a shepherd to God's people? What is needed or what is needful and what is his heart? So, uh, Lloyd, why don't you? If it's a matter of thinking whether you are called as a shepherd to know what you would what would be needed. Um, I always remember something Spurgeon said in his pastors that really stuck with me, and it's, I've applied it, is that there's three things that can determine your calling to be a pastor. One is an intense desire you could be happy doing nothing else. In other words, that, that's got to come. And it's not a career choice. It's not like, ooh, I like what he's doing up there. I'd like to try that. This is you can't be happy. You're going to try to do something else, and the Lord keeps bringing you back. So that's number one. The two is that he has given you gifts that would fit a pastor teacher mm -hmm. obviously you need to be able to teach and the feeding the flock is the number one you feed the flock they get mature they find out what their gifts are and the church multiplies healthy sheep beget healthy sheep so feeding uh, so you have the necessary gifts gifts of exhortation are helpful gifts of teaching uh, leading and uh, and then third would be an open door that God has definitely opened this particular door. You go in it, whether you get an internship or you get, you know, thrust into you. I mean, like young man here who did the worship, Gabe, he's, his pastor dies and he's doing air conditioning and next thing he knows he's doing ministry. And now he's, he's being fitted for that work, but it was an open door, his desire to do it. So I think that's, I, if that's really the question that they're asking. Um, Obviously, you might have some other thoughts about like what would be important. You know, First Peter chapter five, um, it says in verse two, "Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but be an example to the flock." And when the chief shepherd appears, then we will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Here we find Peter, who you remember when Jesus restored him to the ministry there on the shores of Galilee. He asked him three times, do you love me? And Peter responded in the affirmative, yes, Lord, I love you. And of course, Jesus told him to feed the sheep, to tend the sheep, to care for the sheep. And here Peter, so many years later, writing as a shepherd, as an elder, an overseer, giving us instructions as to what, what a shepherd is supposed to be doing. There's several things, obviously, to serve. That's really important. The, the sheep do not exist, uh, I should say, uh, for the shepherd. The shepherd exists for the sheep. When I uh, have the privilege of pastoring, and I know these guys feel the same way, we're there to minister. We're there to serve, not to be served. And if you come into the ministry thinking, what can these people give me? Or what can I get from them? You, you're, you're not called. <laughs> you're there to minister, to serve them. And that manifests itself in all different ways. And so that's the first thing. We're called to be servants. We were taught and exhorted from the very beginning that pastor or minister, it's just another word for servant. And uh, that's really important for us, not only serving, but also doing it willingly. Not for, we don't do it for the money, obviously. And we are to be examples. In other words, it's one thing to shepherd people, but it's also another thing to be an example to people. If I say things from this platform, but it's not lived out in my life, then it really is ineffective. I'm not a very faithful and effective shepherd. So for me, and, and what the Bible says, I want to be an example to the flock. And I also know that one day, uh, the Bible promises that we're going to receive a reward. So I think First Peter chapter 5, verse 2, is, is really good insight as to what shepherds should be doing. And I would just speak to the very last part of that question. What is, what is God's heart um, for a shepherd? Um, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16, we read exactly what God's heart is as a shepherd. And so I would direct you to that passage in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16, where it says, For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they're scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, bring them to their own land. I will feed on the mountains of Israel and in the valleys and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be. And he just goes through it. 
I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken, strengthen what was sick. I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. And so you see God's heart as a shepherd in that passage. And you see that, that God's heart as a shepherd is to, be, you know, to, to serve the sheep, to you know, feed them well, to take care of them, to bring them together, not to scatter them. And so it's a very important passage that reveals God's actual heart as a shepherd. And anybody that's a pastor should reflect that heart, should do some, 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 some reflection, some self-reflection, and, and, and ask God, are these the things that you are calling, um, uh, or this is what the Lord is calling me to? Am, am I prepared for this? You know, because it's not going to be a life of ease. It's going to be a life of service. So this is going to be a challenge because we only have limited time, and we're going to have to really run. The, the, we, we could give a message, fully message on all of these questions. That's going to be, you, you put pastors in front of a microphone, it's going to be hard for us to <laughs> limit. But anyway, let's see what we can do. What do you think of the typical altar call in America when Jesus says, consider the loss? Uh, and then it goes on to say, my heart aches at the verse, depart from me, I never knew you knowing people will think they are saved when they're not. 1 Corinthians 8.3 says, If you love the Lord God, you are known by Him also. And the Bible says, If you love Him, you will obey Him. So I guess the question is, What, what do you about think altar of, calls? Yeah, altar yeah. calls, well, you know, I used, to, I used to be very bad at altar calls, not doing them well and, and then trying to follow others that did them. And then I felt like I was a hyping them up. And... The Lord convicted me, but that's just me, because I've seen other people who have the gift, like Mr. Evangelist here. You know, he gives the word and the call to action and respond, and I saw that with Raw. I was in the follow-up with Raw when hundreds of people would go forward every Sunday. Surely they can't have understood what the gospel is. Surely this can't be real. Surely they didn't understand repentance. I'm thinking to myself, until I would counsel them, and they really were getting it. Yeah, there'd be a few that wouldn't, but the ones that would, it really encouraged me. God uses altar calls. He also uses when I just say to somebody, look, maybe you need to settle that business with God right now. And it's as simple as calling on the name of Jesus, you know, and believing in him. And after service, we'd love to meet with you and talk with you in the prayer room. So there's a variety of ways to do it. There's no one way to do it. And I think I'm, I'm comfortable with how I'm doing that. We're seeing people come to the prayer room, respond to the gospel every week without the altar call. Sometimes I'll have their razor hands. Sometimes I'll just flow with it. And sometimes I will have an altar call, but... Yeah, I grew up in a church where uh, my pastor, Pastor Chuck, I never saw him do an altar call, I, I, at least in the services that I went to. And Sunday mornings was typically, you know, expounding the word, teaching. And so, but, but even Sunday nights and Thursday nights, we, he never did altar calls. He made people available. You can go back. His thing was you can go, always go back to the prayer room and there'll be people available to pray with you. And so I was a little intimidated to do altar calls when I went and started and planted a church because I thought, well, well, Chuck didn't do it. But that wasn't necessarily his gift. Um, he was a pastor teacher. And, but look how many people got saved through that ministry. But he never had altar calls. So for me, pastoring now, it, it really depends. I want to be led by the Spirit. Sometimes I'll, I'll give an altar call. Sometimes I won't. Um, I think the getting, bringing people forward is one. I think it's a public declaration. But it allows us to connect with them. You know, you could pray in your seat. And you could. Um, and that's fine. And God will hear you. And people do that. And sometimes they come forward afterwards. This last Sunday, we had a lady come forward who had come to church twice. Uh, the, the week before, she's Jewish. Uh, the week before, we just happened to be, you know, that is uh, talking about Israel. And she was there and she heard. And then she came back the next week. She had just lost her mother. And this last Sunday, she'd been praying to the Lord. And, uh, but she didn't know the Lord. So I met with her Sunday. I said, hey, have you, did you ever ask Christ into your heart? I didn't call her forward. She just came for prayer afterwards, introduced my friend. Yeah, she said, I, well, I, I haven't made it official. I said, well, let's make it official. And we just sat there in the front, and she just prayed to receive Christ. So sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's multitudes, especially with outreaches. You yeah, know, you stuff just like have that. to make sure you don't give them the impression by coming forward they're now in the club. In oh, other no. words, I always will say, if you truly have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and believed, that you're a sinner and you have no chance to get to God without him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You trust that. I can't officially tell you as his representative, according to the Bible, your sins are forgiven when you've trusted Jesus, your Lord and Savior. So I can, you can give them that, but not because they came forward. So that's the only thing. Agreed. And I think sometimes we, we get a little nervous about doing altar calls because what if nobody comes forward? Oh, man. I tell you, when you have a church of six people and I'm, I'm giving the message, you know, this is when we started out in Florida, I'm like, 
I know all you people, you know, and like I, but I, but what are you gonna do? Raise your hand. Somebody raise your hand. I'm gonna ask my wife. Just raise your hand and come forward, just so people people will just know. I felt like I needed to go forward. Like I, somebody needs to get saved. Apparently, I'm not doing this right. So it was a little intimidating. No, and then here's what happens typically: you do an altar call and nobody comes forward. What happens as a pastor afterwards? People are in the back, and what do they say? Pastor, hey, I'm really sorry about today. I just feel really bad that nobody came forward. Like, they're apologizing to you. You did what you were supposed to do. I don't control that. But, you know, so you're a little intimidated. But I, I just press through that. I'm going to do it because this is a place where you can bring people. If nobody comes forward, hey, nobody came forward. And if one came forward, it's worth it. So I'm not afraid to do it, and I think it's important. Yeah, I think giving those on-ramps is super important because the Bible says that if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. And so who's to discount that moment when somebody gives their life to Christ in an altar call? I would not discount that moment. Now, if your church is only focused on saying a prayer, well, then, yeah, there's a problem. But if your church is doing what the Bible says and making disciples and there's a discipleship that's happening in your church, then that's a good thing. And so I would ask the person to ask this question, what are you doing to disciple people that get saved in your church? Are you a part of discipling them? That's a huge part of it. Next one here. Explain the, bu- the blindness that is presently happening to Israel. When did it start? When will it end? If it is, oh, this is an easy one, guys. I'm so thankful. Romans. It, 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 if it's nothing more than those who reject Jesus are blinded, how is that any different than the Gentiles? If it is Satan that blinds, then why does God say in Ezekiel, I hid my face from them? Might those who are blinded only be accountable for what was revealed to them? So that's a multifaceted the, question. Bl- there's blindness and then there's blindness. When, John, when Jesus healed the blind man, he said, uh, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But since you say you see, your sin remains. Mm-hmm. So the spiritual blindness um, that they had all the evidence that he was a Messiah, and they rejected it, and then, of course, you see the incremental thing. It's first they couldn't, you know, they, they didn't want to see, then they couldn't see. Now he blinded their hearts. So, and that blindness has come upon them, according to Romans, uh, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So God has fulfilled what he said through Abraham. Through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So when that final, you know, Gentile responds to the gospel before the rapture does, and the Lord receives us up, he's going to finish his program with the nation Israel. He's going to be faithful to do that. Um, in the meantime, there is a hardness of heart. There is a blindness. Um, and, you know, we can just, all we can do now is just uh, lay the groundwork for them to respond in the tribulation, you know, because I really believe there's a lot of labor in ministering among the Jewish people, encouraging them. I'm, I, I always tell people, thank you for, you know, your people gave us the scriptures and gave us our Messiah. And we're, I'm so thankful, and we want to be supportive of what's going on in the nation as well, because God is doing something. So, but Romans 11, you know, 9 through 11 would outline that. Um, there is, but then there's still a remnant. There's still many Jewish people. We have tons of Jewish people in our church because we live in that area, uh, and there's many Messianic Jews. Then there's Messianic Jewish ministries sometimes that get a little bit under the law, I think. There's some challenges there. But a lot of Jewish people are responding, but it'll be the, the real focus in the time of Jacob's trouble uh, after the Gentiles are removed. And yeah, that's a great answer, Lloyd. I, I like to think of it, too, just maybe on a, on, a, on a micro level and a macro level. You know, you think on the macro level, God has a program nationally for Israel. And on a micro level, he has a heart for the people of Israel. And, and we share the gospel God's the one that's going to take care of all the details of the plan. But, um, yeah, we, we know that there's a prophetic program, and Israel's involved as a nation. And then we also know that, hey, they're people, and, and God loves people. And so we want to share the gospel with them on that level. John. I was going to say also that, you know, part of the purpose of the tribulation period, the Bible makes it clear, the 70th week of Daniel that has yet to unfold, that last seven-year uh, period known as the tribulation period that will come upon the earth, is one to judge a Christ-rejecting world. But the second purpose of that tribulation period is to bring the Jewish people back to her Messiah. Amen. And, and that's something that God's going to do. And he's going to fulfill his plan. Keep this in mind. I just want to, as you guys were talking, I just wanted to, to make you aware of something. And, and I'm, I'm sure that you are. You're well taught. But there is a, 
uh, teaching circulating in certain places, and it seems to resurface, it kind of comes and goes, but certain groups believe in what is called replacement theology. And basically that the church has somehow replaced Israel. And what God said he was going to do with Israel is not going to happen. And, and it's now all the promises are for the church, which is ridiculous uh, when you really read through the scriptures because God made an everlasting covenant with Israel. And even though they failed on their end, God's not going to fail on his end. He's going to fulfill it. They're, they're, they will be grafted back in. They're, they're the original. So uh, Paul makes that clear. In, and just for further reading, Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about God's past dealing with Israel. Romans chapter 10, God's present dealing with Israel. Romans chapter 11, he covers the future uh, purpose with the nation of Israel. And so just a good time of study. But, but God's not done with them. He's, he has a plan. Good time for personal evangelism to Jewish people, too. I always encourage them, listen, for one, if one encounter I have with somebody, I'll say, if at least I get you to maybe take just another look at Jesus. I know a lot of Jewish people don't believe because of everything they've heard. They don't, they'll never read Isaiah 53 in the synagogue. That, that's shocking just to know that, but it's true. And um, I'd ask them why and ask them to reconsider, to think it through. And, uh, but in the meantime, God has his program at work, but if he puts you in front of somebody to minister and reach out to them, do it. All right, great answers, guys. The next one is a, is a good question. Looks like it's coming from a, a parent, but it says, what can you say to the parents of a prodigal who's been caught up in the deception of the trans movement? How do we pray for her? That's a heavy one. Well, I understand a prodigal because I had one. And uh, the Lord mercifully, after 20 years of hard rebellion, he had, he'd, he'd bought into the philosophical things, not because we were bad parents or bad witnesses, um, but you beat yourself up anyway because you think you failed. But uh, he, he bought into Nietzsche and Superman, the idea of to divorce yourself from all family and, and uh, live a stare from all, all emotion. And that really messed him up. And eventually, you know, he abused, you know, medications. He's on full disability with the Air Force. Anyway, but right now, what your question is in regard to the trans thing, how do you, how do you reach somebody? Uh, this is a big question right now among circles. You know, um, uh, Alistair Begg took some heat in regard to how he answered, should I go to the wedding of someone in a same-sex relationship uh, if it's somebody I know? I don't agree with Alistair on that, but I don't demonize him for it. Um, I just feel like you must speak the truth, and when you go to a wedding, you are actually witnesses. The inferred question is, we don't ask the question anymore, but it's inferred. Does anybody have any problem with this union? Speak now or forever hold your peace. As a witness, you're consenting with that union, and you can't in good conscience. But there are many other ways to show support to somebody struggling with same-sex attractions or gender confusion. There's lots of ways to show them you know, a respect as a person, disagree with them. In fact, that's one of the things we're getting sucked into a whirlwind that if you disagree with someone, you're naturally enemies. And that's not the case. We need to show them how to disagree with still respect. But it is, um, it's a growing thing. Uh, the, the, the trans person is going to say, you know, apparently you're rejecting me. And uh, so therefore, how can I even accept you as my parents? I think the comeback is essentially is no, you're rejecting 5,000 years of human history and tradition, how we raise you, all of what we believe, you're rejecting that. And so we can't follow you on this journey. We'll still love you and appreciate you as, our, as, a, as a child. We can't play the pronoun game. We can't talk to you. We still see you as our son or our daughter, whatever that is. You have, you have to speak the truth in love. Yeah, I think you uh, was thinking of 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, where it says, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Of course, so many verses on prayer, pray without ceasing. Um, I, I would say pray and, and w w don't stop. <laughs> You know, it's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. And you, like Lloyd said, you love, but a lot of times you, there's not a lot you can say, especially those that are deeply entrenched and relationships obviously are, are now uh, hindered in so many ways. And, but I would pray, I would pray because really they're blinded by the devil. The devil has blinded their eyes and the only one that can open their eyes is Christ. And, and I would say, do not, um, 
forget that nothing is impossible with God, that God can do anything, even open the eyes of someone who's believed the lie and, and bring them back to the truth. And um, boy, that's, it's tough, but I think we have to pray. And, and, and we, also need to, we also need to stand our ground and not uh, you know, affirm that, hey, we're, we're okay with it. I had a good friend who's a pastor, um, and he raised his kids in the Lord, and his daughter ended up choosing the lesbian lifestyle. And so sad, and she ended up getting married to her partner. And then now they have a child, and he's just, I mean, you just feel like your kid died. You know, it's like, but, but they're tr- seeking to love their grandchild. And uh, it's, just, it's just, there's nothing easy about it. It's sin, man, and then we got to pray. God, open the eyes. I would just add to that that I think it's important what you're saying, John and Lloyd, that you love them, but yeah. you don't, con- you don't um, compromise on the truth because when they get to the other side of that, th- they're going to be looking around going, well, who was just, kind of, you know, encouraging me to do the wrong thing and who was encouraging me to do the right thing. And they're going to reach out to the ones that they see, hey, truly loved me through this time and, and, and didn't just, you know, cave in to the ideology of the world, but they stood to the truth, the principles of the truth. And that's the person they're going to come back to when, when, the, when the world chews them up and spits them out and they're broken, you know, and they're looking for healing. They're going to come back to the one that was loving them enough to be truthful to them, I think. So... I was going to say also, I think, as Lloyd alluded to, that we're living in a time when you can't disagree and still be loving. I mean, uh, those of you that are married, uh, ever disagree? Probably not in this room, but, you know, you, you disagree, <laughs> but you're still loving. I still love you. I, I just disagree with you. And, there, and, and this, the culture now is, that doesn't want us to just um, accept it. They want us to celebrate it. They want us in the parade. They want us to affirm it and give them, you know, celebrate their month. I mean, no, no, that's, that's not what we're going to, we're, we're still, we, I, we love these people, but we're not going to, um, placate or, uh, you know, affirm or celebrate, uh, be, because of their decision. Especially if you affirm a child before puberty, oh, yeah. you might as well give them a death sentence. Anybody who affirms a child, a confused child that will believe anything, yeah. that they can choose their se- their gender. This this is just gender is a meaningless term. It's it is a made up word. Um, God made us male and female, and you know man and woman. And they they've toyed with the. They, look, we all have the same vocabulary, but they've got their secret little dictionary, and so everything means something different. And we just have to stand by truth because the more confusing it gets. The studies are out now. That's why Europe is abandoning the whole trans thing and the surgical. And, and honestly, I think uh, some have called for the arrest and prosecution and conviction of any, any of these people that would perform these surgeries on minors because it's going to come back and bite them. They're going to be in jail. I pray they get it, go to jail because it's just it's a cruel and inhuman thing uh, to go on someone's feelings, change their and irre- irreplaceable. So we have to stand up. If we don't, they'll call us hateful and bigoted, the whole thing. You know, we're, that, that, that stuff just does, I don't even care anymore. Uh, I love people enough to speak the truth to them, bottom line. Amen. And, and, and I would just add, you know, we've, we've really got to count the cost on this, guys. We've got to count the cost of what it's going to take to look somebody in the eye and say, I'm not going to go along with the lie. I'm going to tell you the truth about your, your girl, and I'm going to stick to that truth no matter what it costs me. So we need as Christians to, to count that cost because we're living in this, these kind of days. Um, our next question says, um, the question that seems to be a hot topic relates to worship music from groups like Bethel, Hillsong, Jesus Culture, etc. I've heard many say, we'll use it in our worship as long as it is theologically correct. I have a difficult time reconciling supporting churches through downloading their lyrics from CCLI that share a different gospel. Your thoughts? No longer slaves. Jesus, we love you. Goodness of God. Raise a hallelujah. Ever be. I just wrote all these down the other day to talk to our worship team. These are all songs we sing. They're all Bethel. They, they came out of Bethel. They came out of some really good songwriters that Bethel has the marketing strategy to employ. And so you have this amazing group of people writing these very good songs by a group that's going to use it to promote their whole thing. And whether it's Built Hillsong or Bethel, they've got their own agenda. Um, I, I, my, t- my, my boilerplate land answer is often, you know, it is well with my soul, is a hymn that we all sing 
but that, that man was a heretic later in his life, believed in, in universalism. And um, yet we still sing that song. Is that song bad because of where he went? Uh, that's my boilerplate answer. Uh, but the argument again, how much money is going into the coffers of these false teachers from Bethel and you can learn how to become a prophet for a certain amount of money. It's like Simon, you know, was trying to sell or he wanted to buy that power to anoint somebody with the Holy Spirit. We're seeing this in Bethel. They're, they're totally corrupt. They need to be rebuked. They're of the devil to do that. But, you know, uh, yeah, we still play their song. So I'm, I'm wrestling with that, honestly. I, uh, and, and typically someone will, in, in the congregation, will pose this question. So it's not something I haven't heard before, you know, as if I, I'm clueless on, do you know where that came from? And yeah, I know where it came from. Uh, this, might, this might come as a surprise to some of you, um, but Pastor Chuck Smith, great favorite Bible teacher, probably for me of all time, has a radio program. It's called The Word for Today. Do you, do you know what song he uses on The Word for Today and who wrote it? A guy by the name of John Wimber, who was... Head of the Vineyard, uh, the song that plays for Pastor Chuck's radio program. That, now, some of you don't stop listening to him just because you heard that. But I think, you know, this guy, that's grace right there. I mean, oh, that, you, let the song. yeah, it, and it, it sounds almost like that. But it, it uh, <laughs> and it's, um, but the, the point is, the point is, you know what I'm saying? Like, he, he uses that as his tag and has forever. And uh, it's just a point. I, I think. It has to be theologically sound. If it isn't, then we don't play it. I, I, don't, um, I don't make a big deal about it. If it's not theologically sound, we, we scrap it. But there, there's a lot of songs that, um, that we will sing that I can, I, I can sing that in good conscience before the Lord. I didn't know who wrote it, but what that says, that's my heart. I, I think the I challenge can, is the money that going into the coffers. I don't even think about that. Yeah. I don't, that's not even a thought in my mind. I'm not even, I'm not processing that. I'm not, I'm royalties, not, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not thinking about royalties. I'm not thinking about that. Um, I'm thinking about just what I'm saying, what I'm singing. And I tell you, there's some of these songs that are written by these people that have gotten me through heavy things. I don't even know who wrote it. It just ministered to me. Um, so I, I think it's, here's what I think. Let everyone be convinced in his own mind. Let, if that's the Holy Spirit saying that to you, you if you only want to sing Maranatha songs from 1980, then you could do it. Um, and, you know, but you'll find that even some of those people who wrote those songs uh, didn't continue to walk yeah. with the Lord. I mean, where does it stop? I'm, I'm really so, praying for a new generation of uh, worship leaders and writers and songwriters. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's exactly right. Um, you, do you punish that songwriter because the only way their song got publication is through this machinery of man. You know, God will deal with the machinery, but we could also give a disclaimer as well at times. You know, sometimes uh, I get this question a lot as yeah. well. Yeah, I get this a lot as well, guys. And, you know, we could, we could flip the script. You know, we're talking about the, the, the uh, concern over profiting. Well, do you read a New Living Translation or an NIV or an NKJV? Because all of those companies are using the Word of God to profit too, you know? So, I mean, there's always going to be corruption when you've got human beings involved. doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, my boilerplate answer is, you know, would you listen to worship music from somebody who is an adulterating murderer? Um, because David wrote the Psalms, and he was an adulterating murderer. And so, you know, it's like, at what point are you going to draw the line, you know? And so I like John's answer, you know, if, if the Holy Spirit's convicted you on this, then, then you're convicted about that, and you should, uh, you, know, you, uh, obey, you know, follow your conscience on that. But don't try to project that on everybody else around yeah, you, you know, good. and spoil the worship for everybody else, you know? It's like, we're not thinking of those things. I'm thinking about Jesus. And, you know, at our church, we have a filter. Our worship leader, I tell him, we got three things that you need to check before we sing a song. Is it biblically accurate? Is it edifying for the church, and is it Christ-centered? If it meets that criteria, then we'll sing that song because, you know, there's, there's just too many th rabbit holes that we could go down if we're trying to, to you, know, you know, vet everybody's past and whether or not they ever committed a sin. And if they did, we can't sing that song because it's corrupt. No, we're, we're not going to do and, that. And it's if not you're our successful job. to convince somebody to think about it and change songs and this and that, then you, then you just started down a rabbit hole where— now people are not coming in just worshiping the Lord, but they've got to think, where did this song come from? And who wrote it? And where did it, how much money's, and I can't, good, and now the whole sheep is disrupted. That just sounds like a divisive strategy of Satan to get people thinking of something else 
other than just worshiping the Lord. And I, and I actually called a guy on it because he was hitting me up like, and it got to the point where I finally, and he kept, you know, just consistent on it, just hammering on it. Finally, I took him aside and I'd say, listen, brother, I love you. I appreciate you. But maybe you should find a church that only sings the songs that you want to hear. And good luck with that. But, you know, it's like, what are you, you know, and then it was like, oh, no, Pastor John, I didn't mean, blah, 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 blah. okay, just letting you know, like, just kind of put them on notice. Why don't you tell me what's your suggestion? You know, and, and again, I, I think it's a valid question. It's a good point. We hear it often. But I, I, I think it's great criteria that you have, Phil. I really like that. I think that's really a good a good test for what we sing. And, um, and if I don't feel good about it, I've told the guys. I walked up on stage one time when one of my guys uh, sang a song where, where it, was, it was a Hillsong song. Hillsong song. Sloppy and, wet kiss. Uh, no, not that one. I always skip that one. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but it was the one where they talk about um, the Lord, talking about creation, but something's evolving. They use the word evolving. And I was like, I, he was done singing. I walked right up to the pulpit and I said, listen, nothing is evolving. We will never sing that song again. He was a little bummed, but I went up and I whispered in his ear. I said, hey, listen, this is not about you. I'm just, I, I whispered right before I was coming up. I said, I just want to let you know I'm about to say something. So don't take it personal. I'm just going to let the congregation know this is how we roll. So I just let, I put everybody on notice. We don't, we don't, nothing evolves. We will never sing that song again. You know, we've even, we've even changed words of, you know, we've taken the liberty. A change words. This would be a great song if you change that. And right. we did. Yep. We we've changed done that it. too. Uh, so anyway, yeah. I, and I would just exhort anybody that's a worship leader or if you're involved in worship and song selection to be aware of the heresies that are out there because there's new apostolic reformation. There's dominion now theology. A lot of that is working. It's seeping its way into some of these songs. So read the lyrics and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. If you've got a question, bring it to your pastor. Hey, pastor, yeah. is this song okay? You should be doing that as a worship leader. Don't, you know, if you have a question or a doubt about a song, you should bring that to your pastor, and you should be asking him, hey, what do you think about this song? Because your pastor is the shepherd of that church, and he's going to be accountable to the Lord for what, the gate, what gateway is opened in that worship service. And so I want you to know that, uh, worship leaders, be praying, be, be, be trying to um, have discernment about these songs, um, because a lot of them are, you know, being peppered with this false uh, doctrine. That's right. All right, a number of CC pastors make frequent trips to Israel, including Pastor Phil and Pastor Lloyd. What insights have these trips, or have these pastors picked up from Israel, Israeli friends about Hamas, the Third Temple, and Israeli sovereignty, etc.? So what insights have we picked up from Israeli friends and Hama about Hamas, the third temple and Israeli sovereignty. Yeah, well, Hamas is just a death cult. Um, yeah. They need to be completely eradicated. Uh, they abuse children to create death, and moms rejoice when their kids go to death. It's it's a death cult. It's just it's evil. It's funded by the enemies of Israel, obviously, and uh, the West. So. You know, they're, uh, look, when you see the Gazians crying out for deliverance from them, and then the Hamas is actually more focused, they care less about Israel bombing them, and they care more about whether their people are saying anything bad against them. They will kill their people if they say anything against them. So it is a h horrible regime. The sooner they get rid of these Hamas leaders and completely eradicate them, the hard part is to eradicate those ideas that get planted in a kid's life so the next generation grows up to become even worse. Uh, that's one thing we saw and when we were down there on the border and seeing the horrendous things, words can't even describe the evil nature of it. And most people that have saw those videos that they only showed, you know, uh, news media, they were so bad, uh, yet it didn't take long for the news media to now squawk about what, how far Israel's going and look, you, had, you got 400 terror miles, money spent that was given to them to build a better society. They could have the most amazing vacation place in the world in Gaza. Uh, instead, they turned all that money into terror tunnels to kill. So this is the world we live in. And, um, uh, but as far as uh, going and, and seeing how people live under this constant threat, um, when we're up in the north, we were basically, we had this little app that warned about where the things were hitting. And literally, you know, every time we moved into another area, some other areas that we were in just got hit. So this is how they're living. So it's a, it's a challenge, but um, I'm praying that the Lord will give them the victory on this. And, uh, but we're still planning going in next, next year. We've got a planned trip in April. 
we're um, we're going to go. We're going to be supportive. Uh, tourism is a huge part of their industry, and the Bible comes alive like nothing else. You, it's a scratch and sniff Bible when you get back from your trip. Every time you read in the Bible, you're like you can see it, smell it. You realize, wow, that was there. It's powerful. Amen. And, and we're we're going in March, so we'll be there right before you. I'll I'll leave a special scratch and sniff for you there, um, <laughs> present. But uh, any, I'll let you know where it is. But <laughs> but yeah. Phil, Phil, Phil was here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I agree 100 percent with you on Hamas, evil organization to the core. They brainwashed the children in Israel that the <clears throat> Israelis bread is baked with the blood of the Palestinians, and they teach their kids this. And so the kids grow up just fearing Israelis. And um, it's just a, it's an absolute horrible situation. Um, I would just say that, you know, this is a time when as many, uh, the, the, especially the church, we need to stand with Israel. We need to show support for Israel because they really are on a worldwide level being persecuted. And, and it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's a sign of the end times, obviously. But um, they need it. They need our support. They need to know that, hey, we stand with you. And if you know somebody that's Israeli, if you know somebody that's Jewish, let them know that you support them and you love their country and you're praying for them. It means so much to them right now. It means a lot to them to hear that because they don't hear that from anybody. And I mean, uh, you know, you just have to look at the universities across our nation to see what kind of what kind of feed they're getting all the time. And so uh, it's super important right now to show your support for them. And uh, yeah, that's and, and be praying for them, obviously. And we're excited. I'm excited to go over there in uh, March of next year. So if you're part of our church, um, get signed up for that trip. I think we still have some spots. All right. What are your thoughts on who the two witnesses are? Um, Moses and Elijah. That's my, my that's my take. Uh, some see Zerubbabel. Some see, you know, some others. But um, that's where I am. Uh, Canon Lloyd. Okay. Just kidding. Amen. I won't be there. I know you won't. I would agree. Uh, yeah. uh, go ahead. I agree go, with Lloyd. Go ahead. What That's all I was going to say. I agree with that. Moses and Elijah, that would be who the I, most I likely suspects yes. uh, representing the law and the prophets. Yes. And, and I think the reason, too, you know, uh, when you think about it, when you go to Revelation chapter 11 and you see, well, for sure we know Elijah. That's for sure. Uh, people kind of question Moses. But when you see the description of what these guys are going to be able to do, it's very Moses like. Similar things that they were doing, uh, similar miracles that they will be performing. And also, as uh, they were the two that were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. So uh, that seems like the two of them are so significant, as Lloyd said, representing the law and the prophets, that they're going to be that they're going to be there. P people want to debate. I remember one guy coming to church one time and he was so like the most important issue in his life. The biggest question he had, whether or not he's going to be a part of our church, is who I felt the two witnesses were. And, uh, you know, because he really felt like Enoch was going to be I, one of them. I had one of the witnesses visit our church. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so whoever visited Lloyd's church, him and Elijah. So I, but the point was, this guy was so set on who are the two witnesses. And for me, you know what I always tell people? You know what, guys? Here's what we know for sure. There's going to be two. I mean, just keep going. Like, it's just, it's not a salvific issue. It's not about salvation, but, oh, man, who's the, who's the two witnesses? And then another question would be like, you know, uh, the Nephilim, were they demons or were they, you know, it's like, and I'm, whether I come to your church or not, determine, like, how about if I just tell you who Jesus is and how to get saved and the resurrection? And, like, the, there's some things we don't know. But I think, uh, so, so when you come to passages of Scripture, thanks, guys. When you come to passages of Scripture where, you know, it doesn't say exactly, just say, well, here's what it does say exactly. There's two. And I do believe they're Moses and Elijah, but a lot you know. of speculation on the Nephilim too. Like yeah, some I don't even want to go there. I didn't that's like I know. a question. The, the Antichrist I don't want to lead you down that. Right. I don't right. want to track you down there. A lot there, of so. speculation. I'm teaching on that in a couple of weeks. Cause, so could you guys speculate? I would love I'll, to quote hey, you. I'll send you my I notes. Quote you got, on this. I, I was at a think tank in Dallas. Uh, a guy gave a message on it, and then everybody kind of critiqued it. But he went. He was full bore, uh, angelic Nephilim and Antichrist is Nephilim, and he was trying to prove it. But he got challenged pretty strong on it. So it's, it's hard to say, uh, you know, about the Antichrist. But I, I typically believe that they were sons of God, angelic beings, because that's the most natural reading, though it doesn't make sense to us. Um, but, again, we're, we don't want to get into yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't even want to take us down that road. <laughs> but uh, You did, you did. Here's yeah. what we know. Whatever happened was bad enough for a worldwide flood, and they all got wiped out. That we know for sure. 
because it says that. But and anyways, in everlasting change. So they're, they're angels that didn't left their first estate. So right yeah. there, there, you know, what's amazing. There are there are amazing godly commentators that are on that side. And I've read all their arguments and they're powerful. Mm -hmm. And I've read other guys on the other side who are godly and, and yeah. incredible. And he just kind of and when I if, for example, if you're a pastor here today, when you're teaching that section, Let's say, for example, you're teaching a section that you can't necessarily be dogmatic about. Skip it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you're actually, not. Actually, no, no, no. I wouldn't <laughs> say skip it. I would That's say. That's what Pastor still, Chuck did. That, no, actually, well, I think what Chuck would say is this. There are those, and he would give you an understanding of yep. what's out there. But there are also those who, da 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 da, da and he would list it. And then he would say sometimes, but I tend to lean toward, and, and that was good. I think yeah. that helps your yep. people understand. Even the pastor doesn't have it completely figured out. But this is what people say, and I could see this, and I could see that, but this is what I stand. Yep. That's a great explanation. Thanks. I think a good question is, what are some of the things that are like this, that you held one position, and then you held another one, and then you went back to the other one, and, and you've, I've had that with a few things. Right. Where you've oh, yeah. been convinced, and then you see something else. You went, that's one of that's them. That's right. That one that you mentioned. That yeah. one, I've, I've gone back We've and gone forth back on that. we gone back and yes. forth on a few of them, and you know, because they're not, uh, the Lord will make it clear yeah. one day. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Next question says, are there times that you shouldn't pray out loud because the enemy can hear and work against your prayer? That's assigning the enemy way too much power. I, I think that he is, look, if we could see the whole demonic realm as afraid of these little balls of clay God has made, who have believed in Jesus now, are sons of God, and they're worried about us, and they're, they're trying to mess with us, but they have no real authority and no power. I have no problem praying out loud, and I've never thought of that for a moment. Uh, that, that is uh, human thinking, that uh, we've got to keep our prayers secretive. You know, this present darkness kind of created a situation where, you know, all that thoughts of this, this spiritual realm, and we've got to figure this realm out, and nonsense. You know, they're, they're much more worried about what we do, which is why they want to disrupt what we do with the gospel. So we should just be about the gospel. And uh, when it comes to Satan, do I hear a noise? You know, it, really, that's what it is. We should not fear him. We, uh, I fear God. God. God will, whatever Satan, he's the most frustrated being in the whole world because whatever Satan does gets woven into God's perfect plan anyway. So um, have at it. You know, Jesus prayed out loud. I mean, we, yeah. we have it recorded. So obviously he didn't have a problem with it. And um, the disciples often said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so I think I, I sometimes, especially like in the morning, I, I like to pray out loud. I mean, I can't be too loud. I don't want to wake anybody up. But but I, I think it's something about praying out loud with the Lord. It keeps me, it, my mind engaged sometimes. So I, I pray out loud. I pray in quiet, pray in my mind, you know, but I think it's, there's a blessing of praying out loud too as well. Amen. And I love that we just go back to the Bible. Like, do we have prayers out loud in the Bible? Yes, we do. And so let's, let's do that. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes this thought, this question is coming from this rise today in the deliverance ministries that we see. There's a lot of popularity given to demons and these demon slayers and these guys that are getting promoted to apostles and they're going around and teaching all kinds of wacky stuff about spiritual warfare, guys. And that stuff's heresy. It's coming from men. It's not coming from the Bible. And we need to be really careful uh, that we don't get get led astray by these things. And um, we, we need to stick. This is where the word of God becomes so important in our lives. We come back to the Bible over and over again. We've got to be Bereans. You know, um, do we see prayers in the Bible? That's, that's, that's where we can find the answers to these questions. But be careful that we don't get caught up in the excitement and the emotionalism that surrounds all of this spiritual warfare stuff because it's very attractive to the flesh. It's very attractive to the flesh, and it's getting very popular in some places today. you got Greg Locke out in Tennessee, huge church, going all over the country teaching about this deliverance ministry stuff, and it's, uh, it's just wacky. Um, there was a documentary that just came out, Come Out in Jesus' Name. They were showing it in the theater right here in Reno. Yep. Wacky stuff. You know, it's, it's not biblically based. They flash a Bible verse on the screen, yeah, and then they expect you to, to, to think that what follows is biblical. It's not. They're taking those scriptures totally out of context because they have a pretext and they're trying to, to, to push their, their stuff. So We, we would so teach people careful. that you have authority as a believer. You know, we had a call from a family in our church that hadn't been around for a while and they wanted to know if I knew an exorcist. And I said, what do you mean? Well, our son, we're concerned. We, we've been to every doctor possible, but he is this, this, and that. Everyone said he's fine. This is a spiritual or a psychological problem. So I said, well, you don't need an exorcist. Bring him down. So when the young man came, long story short, 
he was definitely manifesting a demon. And I remember walking down from my office to meet him because he wouldn't come up. I went down and he looked at me and he's just snarling and looking at me. And I just walked, he's a big boy. I walked up to him and I said, in the name of Jesus, you have no authority, leave. And the demon left him. It was like no theatrics, no holy water, no, in the name of Jesus. Look, I've seen all kinds of theatrics. It's, it's like nonsense. You have authority as a child of God. When I shared that story, and he, by the way, he was delivered. Um, I told him, still, Satan's going to mess with you. He's going to try to, and he did for a while, but eventually he got stronger. Now he's uh, just graduated from our Virtues campus. He's on fire for the Lord. After six years, he's doing amazing. But here's the thing. Many women then were coming, Pastor, I want you to, to pray for my son. I think he's got a demon. And most of the time, you, you know it wasn't. It was just psychological. And the difference is you can sense a presence. Uh, you, you discerning of spirits, you kind of know this. But the, uh, the, the, so many, I told one mom who said, my daughter or my son is having these dreams and, and having these experiences. It says there's a monster, and literally it's so real to him. So she wanted me to come and pray over the house. And I says, well, why don't you pray? Because you're a Christian. You, God hears you. So she went and prayed and then forgot about a couple of weeks and then said to her son, wait a minute, you haven't said anything for a few weeks. And he said, oh, the demon's not coming back. I said, what, what do you mean? He says, well, because Jesus appeared to me and said, don't worry, he's never coming back. And she said, well, what did Jesus look like? Now, he's like two and a half years old, never read the book of Revelation, and describes Revelation 1. So it was like God just answered, and that little child who was being harassed by something came in their home somehow. In a moment, a child of God prays. It doesn't, she didn't have to have a pastor or a degree, have the authority. So all of this, 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 this whole marketing of demon demonology, it's a cottage industry now. And don't get into it. Just take authority as a child of God. Yeah. Amen. That's so good. And yeah, and, and I do believe in demons, and I do believe in demonic possession and all of that. I wasn't saying that, just so everybody's yeah, clear. Yeah. But we can get caught up in the fleshly yep. side of it and the, and the dramatic side of it. So I um, do believe. I do believe. I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> Come out in Jesus. No. I'm just what are you going through in your own personal devos? What a great question. I'll start this one off. Um, I'm currently reading through um, the chronological Bible, um, just going through the Bible in a year. Uh, currently just finished the book of Ecclesiastes, and man, I am loving it. I love to read. I've, I've read the Bible several times, but getting to read through it in chronological order this year is a huge blessing for me, um, and, and it's, a, it's a great, it's, a, it's, it's really fun just to see, to read things in the order that, you know, these people think it happened, you know, because we don't we don't know 100 percent. Nobody was there you know, at the time. But we, we have a good idea and it's laid out in a chronological order. And I'm loving it. Just having a great time going through it. I can't believe you're saying that because um, I know you're a day or two ahead. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I guess I'm in Ecclesiastes. I finished chapter seven today. I oh, think okay. It was, so. I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a day ahead because I finished Ecclesiastes. I'm in the same chronological oh, okay. Bible reading he's in and I'm loving it. And I and I love it because. It's like, you know, you know, seeing where David is talking, you know, in the Psalms during the cir circumstances he's in and Solomon and all of that stuff is kind of chronologically, it's kind of fun. Anyway, but that's what I'm doing the same thing. I'm also reading through the Bible. I'm in several places, uh, you know, Bible through the year. But I don't get, if I get behind a day or I don't get to read all the, ch I don't. I don't freak out. Some people are like, oh, my goodness, I didn't make it. You know, they, they stop. Like, I just keep reading. I keep going. And, and uh, I also, in addition to reading through the Bible, and I'm in Chronicles right now, and I'm in Psalms, and I'm in Proverbs, and I'm also in, uh, in the New Testament as well. When, I, when I'm reading through, I also journal. So I write down what I read. I, I write down. I feel like the best way to, to understand is to read it, to write it, and then to share it. And I feel like then I've got it. And so for me, I, I like to read it. Verses that stand out to me, I'll highlight, and then I'll go back to my journal, write them down, make some kind of application or prayer. And so I, 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 I journal a lot, and I think it's good. And I'd encourage men, uh, if you don't journal, it's not a diary, uh, you know. It doesn't have a little key that you wear on your neck. Dear you know, it's like, diary. It's a, it's a journal, <laughs> man. It's a journal. Like Ken has a journal, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So, no, but it's good to write, write things down. And you know what's great about it? The, the coolest thing about having a journal is I can go back from today's date, and I can look three years back. I can pull a journal out and go, man, it's amazing where I was and what I was writing at this time. 
and I, I, I look at the prayers that have been answered and what God has done. And I'm excited that when the Lord takes me home that all my journals my kids will have and they can go back and see what their, how their dad, you know. It's just, I don't do it for that purpose, but it's just kind of cool to have that history with God and uh, to see it. It's cool. I, I write journals as well, but I, I'm going to burn mine when I die. It's going to be, I don't want anybody reading that stuff, man. Uh, this one goes along with it. It says, how do you balance studying the Bible, a reading of it, and the reading of other books as well. So how do you balance studying, reading, other, and reading other books as well? I remember what Chuck said about commentaries that really uh, always stuck with me. Um, he said, if you're going to read, if you're going to, obviously you go to the Bible first. You let the Lord speak to you. Um, I don't even go to my old notes. I just want to go let the Bible speak on that particular subject and what it is, pray it through, let that settle in my heart. And, and then I'll do word studies and that sort of thing, but I'll, I'll, I will eventually get to commentaries. But the key is, he said, don't just read a few. Read, read as many as you can because you don't get locked into one man's looking at it, one man's way of seeing it. Because one thing you'll also find if you read four or five commentaries on that particular passage, you'll discover a consensus on the main things that you'll kind of know, okay, so these are the main things because everybody's on the same page with this. But this guy had this take on this, this guy had this take on that, so then you hold those lightly because there's different takes. It gives you a sense of what is, essentially, this is the main consensus on this from people that have really studied it. So I, and I take that, but I also, again, in all my preparation then for a message, the last thing I do is realize, and I think I said this in my message, you know, I think I got this, but Lord, you know all things. So I want it to be a living word when I get up, but um, anyway, that. Was it was the question about do we read in addition to what we're reading or yeah how do you balance studying the Bible studying the and Bible. then reading it and then reading other books too like just like books that you would read that are just for your Christian life yeah I think how do you so balance it I tell you it is challenging you know I I have a library full of books but I, I think um, one way to do it, especially pastorally speaking I, I mean I'm teaching uh, Monday nights I teach Wednesday nights I teach three times on Sunday morning and uh, and then maybe a conference here and there um, so it, it is challenging. But one thing that you can do is maybe before you go to bed at night, maybe you just the last thing you do is you take a book and just you, you take it and sometimes you think, well, it's so big. But if you just read a little bit at a time and you just end on that, and that's one way to do it. Also, maybe on your lunch hour or your lunch break or, or something. And if you go on vacation ever, I love to read books on vacation. I feel like I'm always like, okay, this is my chance to read. You know, I take like two or three books and just like try to try to get through it and really absorb some things and just really when I have free time. It is it's a challenge, man, because you're for us. I mean, I feel like what we do is so you're constantly reading. You're constantly you're in a you're in a continual state of preparation. I'm leaving here. But in my mind, I'm starting a brand new book of the Bible, the Gospel of John. Church doesn't know yet, but we're starting the Gospel of John. And I, I'm already like my mind is I'm, I'm a steps ahead thinking about and prepping and reading and starting that process because Sunday morning, um, I, I got to be ready to go. So it's, it's a challenge to balance it all out. There's a lot of things I want to read. I picked up, I bought a book here yeah. and I, I'm hoping I get to read it. Do you guys get books given to you all the time too? I seem yes. to get books given to me all the time. I have a stack of them in my office yes. that I, I'm like, I don't know if I, I'm ever going to get to I treat these, it this so. way. I have, a st I have a stack of books that I bought that is priority, stack of books people have given me. And when I get through with what God wants me to do, I'll get to this stack. And if I get through that stack, then I'll get to this stack. It's, it's just you can only do so much. But there's other things, too, like you, you would like to write. I mean, I'd like to write. I mean, I've written a couple of books, but I'd like, you know, it'd be good to, you know, I'd love to write some books. Like, when are you going to have time to write a book? You know, you're, you're, you're in the midst of, like, trying to piece things together. It's, it's a real challenge. I find it. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. You got to. How did Spurgeon do it, man? Write all that stuff he wrote. The one thing that I've, I've tried to do that I was taught by my pastor was to don't don't make your personal reading time and your personal 100%, 100%. devotions the time that you're studying for a message. That's right. You know, Amen. keep that separate. That's yeah. your relationship with yep. the Lord. And then you, and then it's time to study. Amen. And I feel like I'm always cramming for a test, you know, you know, yeah. reading, reading, reading. Yeah. But one thing that's helped me too is just to read. I'm, I'm a morning person. So in the morning, taking 10 minutes after my personal devotions are over to read something that's edifying to me or something that I wanted to read or right. something I'm going through, or sometimes even a class. I, I take video classes sometimes, and I'll do that for a few minutes every morning after my devotions are over, and that seems to help me get through books. So that's kind of how I balance it. The that. other thing that's cool, too, my son's really turned me on to this, and uh, again, I'm, I'm old school, so I need to get more in tune with it, but the audio aspect of, you know, you drive, yeah. you just turn Driving. on an audio book yep. and suddenly you're listening to a book or you're going for a walk and you just, you just went through five chapters and you just, you just 
you know, walked. And I've done, cool. I got audible.com. I've dozens, yeah. dozens of books that I've, yeah. I've listened to. And then I've also got the book because I wanted to highlight things and I listen to them again. Sometimes they're, I'm going through right now the querying of American, chi uh, you know, child that is giving the whole background to what's going on in our nation. And if you get a chance to listen to James Lindsay's 30 minute, you know, message to parliament in March, 2023, 20, in 30 minutes, he describes to you why all this stuff that makes no sense is happening. Yeah, so it's really good. It's that's a really good a very, speech that he gave. That's a great speech. James yeah. Lindsay, James Lindsay European Parliament, it's powerful. And he's written a number of books as well that I've read on this subject of, because I need to know, if I'm gonna minister to this culture, I need to understand where they're coming from. I need to understand their thinking and what's happening. Then I can apply the truth of the word of God to their situation. All right, so we're out of time, but we'll, we'll end on this one. It's an easy one. It's a fun one. Uh, what is a biblical event that you'd like to see on the big screen? For me, I'd say David and Goliath. I'd just love to see that. I think it'd be cool. I could see him doing a good job with that one, too. Oh, I, I got I to gotta go with Cecil B. DeMille, the Red Sea Crossing. Okay. That would be pretty amazing. But, you know, I, I want to say, we, this is, because I'm just going to finish my last thing here and then turn it to John, but um, we, have a, we have a call in through our radio station, but it's also on a lot of other radio stations. But if you don't get it, you can also go to bridgebibletalklive.com, and we field these kinds of questions uh, all the time. And it's live. We don't know what's going to be asked, but so many people ask similar questions. Uh, some people ask some very unique ones. I've had some that have said, you know, that's a great question. I have no clue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look at that. But it's, it's fun just because people think in terms of, like, you're reading things and you have questions. My big answer is, you know, someone will read something. I don't What does that mean? Just keep reading. But what about just keep reading? I know, but just keep reading. You keep reading. The Bible is your answer. We're, we're not special men up here with these answers. We, we have a kind of, what, probably over 100 years of collected time studying the scriptures, things will come to our mind of our experience with the, what the scriptures say to answer a question. And uh, so if you have questions like that and you want to go on bridgebibletalklive.com, you call in, uh, or you can just listen in, it, it's, a, it's a great resource. Any of you guys listen to, um, to Every Man and Answer on CSN around here? All right, hey, listen, on Tuesdays, do me a solid, call in. Love to hear from you guys. Ask a question. Uh, if you guys listen in on Every Man and Answer, that'd be great to hear from you. Um, but also, as it relates to the big screen, I think, what was like the tongues of fire like? You know, were they actual tongues? Like, what, what was that like when they all got, when the Holy Spirit blew in that upper room? And like, I'd, like, I'd be curious to see what that looked like. Yeah. You know, because you see pictures, and there's like, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know. Or the pillar of fire and cloud, that would be. Yeah. Great question. Great questions, you guys. I mean, that's been awesome, Phil. All right. Thank you, guys.